How are we doing, church? Are we okay? A uh, massive thank you to uh, Andy. I know we've appreciated Andy already, but after everyone who serves on the kids' team, we love you. We're so grateful for you. You do a really, really valuable work amongst us. And we just want to thank you again. Um, yeah, no, just absolutely huge. Gosh, that's excellent. Do you know what? I've been giggling this morning. <laughs> Throughout the worship, I found myself giggling, and I do find that sometimes as I worship, a little bit of joy just squeaks out every now and again, and, um, and uh, that's what happened. <laughs> so I find myself, there's nothing funny going on. I just find it funny. I don't know why. I just, it comes out. There you go. Okay, well, look, are we ready to dive into Luke this morning? Yes. Yeah, good. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to need more than that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we are going to go to have a look at Luke this morning. I trust that last week you were, your, your appetite was whetted, was it? Yes, good. Okay, excellent. That's, <laughs> that's really, really good. Okay, we're going to read some scripture together. I have to say I haven't got any slides uh, this morning. So if you have a Bible, please can you get your Bible out? Uh, otherwise, you just got to have to listen to me. So we're going to read from Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read quite a big chunk of scripture from 5 right the way through to 38. So, Luke 1, 5 to 38. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, where you would be, wouldn't you? And uh, fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink uh, wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Wow. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away the reproach among people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? 
And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow, it's a big chunk of scripture, isn't it? Big chunk of scripture. But I hope you felt something of the impact of that as we went through it. Because actually, when you go through it, it's quite a dramatic start to this gospel. It's quite a, quite, this gospel is basically starting with a bang. It's a little bit like, um, you may not have felt it there, but it's a little bit like an adventure movie. If you've ever watched a Harrison Ford movie or a um, James Bond movie or a... Mission Impossible, you know often how they start, don't you? They start with a kind of boom, and you're in the midst of the action, and someone's being shot at, and somebody's diving out, and somebody's on a motorbike, and Harrison Ford is leaping off, you know, and then, then they escape, and all goes quiet. And then they go home, you know, back to their base, don't they? And then they're given the mission about which the film is really about. You know what I mean? You, you know? Hello? Yes. Oh, I'm going to need more than that. Come on. I'm not the only one working this morning. So, um... Yeah, so that's and it's kind of what we've got here. Yeah, yeah. Luke is come in with a boom, right. midst of the action. So just listen to what's happened. So God has spoken to an angel. The angel has then come to earth and revealed himself to two different people and given them heavenly messages. Yeah. That's a bit of a, ooh, when you read that. That should make you think, oh, hello, what's going on here? And then incredible things are spoken over both of these uh, children to come including that one of them, we read, will be the Son of God. Yeah. Born as a human, i.e. God is going to have a kid with a human woman. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to look at that and think, oh, really? <laughs> what? And we hear that both of these people, uh, both John and Jesus, are going to have huge impact on the earth, including one of them that is going to have a kingdom that will never end. You men us look at that and think, what on earth is that? A kingdom? Of, but every kingdom ends. What are you talking about? Even the great kingdoms come to... What is this kingdom that never ends? I've never heard of this. So your a question should be going through your mind. What does that mean? And then in amongst all of that, we hear about two people that are going to give birth that can't give birth. You're going to have a virgin without any male help is going to give birth. And you have a barren woman who has been trying for years, who cannot give birth, is going to give birth. So suddenly you're thinking, what's happening here? But just, I can't quite keep up with it. And then just to throw in a little bit more, you have a priest that is struck dumb. <laughs> and you have a young girl left in a potentially disastrous state. You're thinking, what, how is she going to explain this to Joseph? Oh, let me just tell you, I saw an angel. I mean, come on. And there is, no, no, there's going, to be, there's going to be ructions when this girl gets home. So you, suddenly, you, and it's kind of like, that's what Luke's doing. He's saying, boom, let's get you in. I'm going to grab your attention. And then you're going to say, I've got to read this. What? Well, yeah, how does this work? Because it's like it's saying... <laughs> It's like it's saying, tune in next week to find out what happened to, to, to Mary. And how did it work out with Joseph? You know, and, and actually, how did it work out? Is this guy really dumb? Or did he, you know, you know, it's kind of what it's doing. It's a wonderful technique for saying, hey, come on, read this. He's a clever guy, Luke. He's a clever guy. The way he's kind of got, got this. But the, the trouble is slightly, <clears throat> uh, this is how I felt slightly, you could feel a bit punch drunk. You kind of think, oh, what? I haven't worked out this last statement, and suddenly we're on to another big thing, and another drama, and another... Wow. So that's the opening we've got to Luke. Really gripped you and pulls you in. Now, um, we said, didn't we, that uh, Luke was primarily aiming for Gentiles, uh, i.e. non-Jewish people. So they were people who wouldn't have an understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures. And actually, that intro works very, very well, just as standalone. If you didn't know anything about the Old Testament, you would be drawn in by that. However, if you did have a knowledge of the Old Testament, and I'm sure some who read this would, 
you'd get even more from that in that beginning. You'd get this. You would know that this Jesus is likely to be the Messiah. This long-awaited one. This is the one that has been waited for since the beginning of humans. When Adam and Eve first appeared, there was a, a prophetic word. God said over, over the serpent, didn't he? Uh, I'm going to send one and he will crush your head. You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. Talking about Jesus to come. And since that time, we have been waiting for this been slow sense of anticipation. He's going to come. He's going to come. He's going to come. And suddenly, we realize for the first time, God is saying, and he is here. Yeah. He is coming. He is here. The Lord is breaking in. So you'd pick that up, but you, if you had um, Old Testament understanding. The other thing that you would pick up is this. God has just broken a 400-year silence. God has been silent since the days of Malachi. That was the last Old Testament prophet. That's 400 years ago. I mean, that's a long silence. That is a long silence. Maybe somebody has given you the silent treatment. I doubt it was 400 years long. It may have felt like it. But, um, yeah, God has just broken his silence. And uh, the silence, by this point, is deafening. Absolutely, just incidentally, some of the language that Gabriel uses absolutely picks up the language of Malachi. So it's like a bridge immediately over that 400 years. So it's into this sort of backdrop that God suddenly is breaking through. For silence for 400 years, then suddenly he announces he is here. He's going to do this thing. I have to say, you know that bloke I work with? He's down with the kids, isn't he, Ian, at the moment? Yeah. Excellent. I'm completely at liberty, aren't I? You know he's sometimes rude about me. No, no, wait. <laughs> Ian loves an I've asked his permission, actually. Um, Ian loves an entrance. Sometimes, it just does. Sometimes, I can be sitting in my office, you know, just doing whatever, and he just comes in like this. He opens the door and goes, ta-da! <laughs> and he says, I'm here! And I'll say... Oh, yes, so you are. <laughs> oh, yes, you're here. And he was telling me this story. He loves to do this to his kids if he can get away with it. And he said he went home. It was about a year or two ago now. And he, 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 they didn't realize he'd pulled up on the drive. And he'd managed to get in through the front door. And he could see them. And they hadn't noticed him. So he, <laughs> he managed to get a portable speaker with the soundtrack to The Lion King. And he switched it on and burst through the door. <laughs> hey! I, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> They obviously went bananas. <laughs> that is quite an entrance. But God has made an even more dramatic entrance now after 400 years of silence. <laughs> okay, now look, with all this drama going on here, we've got a, you know, as I was reading, I was thinking, but Lord, there's so much going on here. What, what, one, what, how do I latch onto this? What one thing do we boil it down to uh, so we can talk on it? And I think if we just reduce everything down, what's happened here is this. God has spoken. God has spoken. The word of God has come. And uh, what we see here is that God speaks. He speaks into our lives. And uh, there's two aspects, I think, to God speaking here. God reveals two things. He reveals, firstly, the big plan. The big plan that Jesus is coming. And that he's going to send John as a way of preparing the way for this coming Messiah. The big plan, the overarching plan. Uh, what is the purpose of God for this generation? Well, it is all about the coming of the Messiah. It's all about getting ready for that. There is no greater purpose of God on the face of the planet at that time than him, than the coming of Jesus. And, and God is pointing that out to two individuals, pointing that out to Zechariah and also to Mary. But there's not only the big plan that God is showing. He's showing something else. He is showing the individual plan. He's saying to these two individuals, this is the big purpose, and also this is how you fit in with it. This is your plan. 
Zechariah, you're going to have a son. You're going to bring up a son. And this son is going to be part of my big plan. But this is how, Zechariah, you fit in. And Mary, this is what Jesus is going to do. Big plan. But actually, this is the role you individually need to play. I want to say to you, you need both. You need to hear the big plan of God. What is the purpose of God for our generation? What is it? Well, Jesus has made it known, hasn't he? The Great Commission. We go out there, we see people saved, to see the lost drawn in. Wonderful. And God has also spoken to us as a church to say, I want to make you into a large church. But much to my surprise... But God is going to say, no, I want to make you do something very significant with you. I would suggest to you, for us in our generation right now here in Seven Oaks, that's our big plan. God is going to come. Question, what's your individual plan? What's the word of God to you? How is God saying to you, yeah, Steve or Jenny or Peter, this is how I want you to fit in. Another question for you. When did you last hear God speak to you? The Bible says this. My sheep hear my voice. They do. We do. We really can. When did you last hear his voice? And if it's a long time ago, oh, I can't really remember. Some of you are panicking right now, aren't you? <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah, well, I don't know. Let me ask you a question. When you last heard his voice, did you do what he said? Because if you haven't heard it again recently, (laughs) my guess is he's waiting for you to do what he told you to do. (laughs) So go do it, and then you'll hear his voice again. Or alternatively, he will just bring you back to the same thing again. Okay, another, I think, uh, important uh, principle we need to see at work here as we're looking at the prophetic is this. When God is about to do something on the earth, he always, always tells people first. He's about to do something. I'm going to do something. He always tells people. Where do we get that from? Amos 3, verse 7, says this. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And then, of course, the prophets stand up and they tell us, don't they? So God always, and so we see that absolutely played out here. God is about to cause his son to be born on the earth. Boom, he's coming. So he announces it prophetically. Uh, Gabriel, go announce it. Question. Why does God do that? Why doesn't he just say, well, I'm God, and so I'm going to do it? And I'm not going to bother to tell them. Or 20 years later, he might say, oh, by the way, I've done this. Anybody know? Okay, I think it's because this. Because when the thing that God says is going to happen, happens, we will all know it was his idea, not ours. Because we're, as humans, we're really good, we're really tempted to say, I think you'll find that was my idea. I mean, I I say this jokingly sometimes. Somebody in a meeting will come up with a great idea, and I'll say, yes, I'm glad I suggested that. (laughs) It always goes down well. Not really. You know, the temptation is to say, yeah, no, that was my idea. And it's important to know who's done it, because once we know that, we know where the credit goes, where the glory goes. So... um, And he says, doesn't he, I will not give my glory to another. God is jealous for his glory. And church, we must not take something that does not belong to us. We mustn't say, hey, we've done well because of our great marketing, our great management, because of our great, you know, whatever. We've done well because of that. Um, No, no, it's God. And actually, that's really important for us as a church right now, isn't it? Because we believe that God has spoken to us as a church. And uh, as I said to you, I've tried to explain over the last few weeks, I feel God is going to turn us from being a kite into a jumbo jet. Do you remember that? There's going to be significant increase. Well, we've got to remember that as that begins to happen, 
Who's really doing that? It's him. It's him. And therefore, it will always be his glory. So none of us can say, I think we're very clever. No, we can't. Actually, if anything, it should bring additional humility to us. Because it will, it will be us saying, God, you allowed us to play a part in your great big plan. You gave me an individual role, and I am so grateful. Because you could have easily done it without me. So it's a humility, I trust, that will bring. Okay. Okay, so we've looked at the kind of big story. This God has come and he's given this big story. God has spoken about his son coming and, and, and John coming. However, I think there is another aspect we really should observe in this opening. And that's the human aspect that's going on here. Because when God, see, when God starts to reveal his big picture, God's going to do this and this. There's a very human response that comes into that. And sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not. That's the truth. And we see both of those responses, those contrasting responses, in both Mary and in Zechariah, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. Can everyone say the word Luke? Luke. Thank you. Good. Yes. Excellent. You're with me. <laughs> I just have to reassure myself sometimes. Okay, so I want to take a look then at both Zechariah and Mary. So we're going to start with Zechariah because it's really important we try and get under the skin of this guy. And uh, it's slightly confusing as well with, with uh, Zechariah because we, are st- we start with a very positive reference, don't we? What, what does it say about Zechariah? That he was righteous and blameless. He was blameless, yeah. So we're introduced to this guy. Both he and his wife are righteous before God. They walk blamelessly in all the commands and statutes of God. Wow. So in other words, the Bible's saying these are really good, godly people. Really good people. I mean, these would be excellent people to have in the church. These would be people that would be reading their Bibles. They would be praying. They would be turning up to prayer meetings. They would be, you know, doing the stuff. Yet, we notice something about Zechariah. Something has happened to Zechariah, and something now is slipping or has slipped out of his life. It's gone, or maybe he never knew how to develop it. And the thing that's gone from Zechariah is faith. So we're given this really lopsided view of a man who is righteous and blameless and has no faith. So we've got a lopsided guy. Which, so you think, uh, those two just sort of don't go together. He clearly is a man who struggles to have confidence in who God really is. That God is powerful, supernatural. He's the God that can do the impossible. That's the last thing that the angel said to Mary. Uh, nothing will be impossible to God. Let me just emphasize that. Zachariah hasn't got hold of that. He has forgotten something. He has forgotten that God is God. That God can do the impossible. What kind of God have you got? Have you got a God that really can do anything? Because let me say something, hopefully graciously. (laughs) If you have a God that can't do everything, you haven't got God. You've got a limited being. And God is not limited in any way. And I wonder how many of us are like this. Yes, I will read my Bible. Yes, I will come to church and I will serve and try and love people. But actually, God, when you break in and ask me to believe for something, I just, I'm just not sure I can quite get hold of that. Don't ask me to go with this anything. You can do anything business. Because I I just can't really... But I'll do this. Are you lopsided as a Christian? (laughs) You'll all be walking around like this afterwards, won't you? (laughs) Sobering, really, actually. And, and, you know, uh, the extent of his lack of faith, I think, is really exposed through his conversation with Gabriel. Just think about what's happened here. So... um, 
Uh, an angel uh, from God has just been instructed to go speak to Zechariah and has just appeared to him in the temple. Okay? And Zechariah is understandably troubled and fearful. Wouldn't you would be, wouldn't you? If an angel appeared to you, maybe it happens to you all the time. Oh, it does. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, it doesn't to me. So it would surprise me if an angel appears. And uh, uh, Gabriel just reassures him. And then he tells him, hey, um, uh, Zechariah, look, your wife is about to give birth to a son after many years of barrenness. And Zechariah's response is, well, how shall I know that then? (laughs) I'm an old man. And, you know, my wife's past it, really. Oh, right, okay, so somehow, somehow he is unable to compute God's, that God is God and can do anything. Even with an angel standing in front of him, telling him to his face, oh, by the way, God is about to do this. Well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> not, so, not so sure. I think, I mean, it, it does make you laugh. Some, do you laugh at the Bible? I laugh at the Bible sometimes. I mean, it's sad, but it's quite funny as well. I think even Gabriel is shocked by the response of blatant doubt. I love these just simple, simple phrase. Gabriel's response to all this stuff is, I am Gabriel. <laughs> I don't normally have this kind of grief. I turn up. People go, whoa, and they fall on the floor. I reassure them. I tell them stuff. And then they go off and do it. I don't have a, well, who are you? I mean, what's this going on? <laughs> That's serious unbelief. That's what that is. That is quite serious. And we see, of course, at this point, that Zachariah is then disciplined. He is struck dumb. And you could say that's a bit harsh on an old fella. Uh, Strike him dumb like that. Actually, look at the result of the discipline. uh, Zachariah moves from, I can't line up with this, I don't agree. We don't actually read it, but later on, he's asked, what are we going to call your son? And he says, his name will be John, because that's what the angel has said. And they say, no, no, you can't call him John. No one in your family is called John. And that's just, you didn't do that then. And he said, no, it will be John. I'm lining up now with the word of God. Before, he couldn't line up with the word of God. Look at the result of discipline. The Bible tells us that God disciplines us, church, because he loves us, because he wants us involved and in. Sometimes your lack of faith, God will have to say, okay, I'm going to bring some, I'm going to get hold of you. It's not going to be pleasant. And it's a bumpy ride. He's been struck dumb. What a, what a, that's scary. But he was struck dumb because of God's love. And it results in good fruit. Okay, so I want to ask a question now. Why do you think Zachariah was lacking in faith? Why have we got this lopsided guy? Because if you're you're godly, if you're righteous, blameless, you would think in amongst all that, you'd have faith too, wouldn't you? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us uh, uh, exactly, but it does give us some hints, I think. And it says this about Zechariah. It says, very pointedly tells us they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. That tells me something. It tells me this. They've been in pain. And they've been in pain for decades. They have been hurting over this and uh, we know that they have been praying about this situation because the angel makes reference to it and I bet you they've been crying out something like but God help us you're God you can do anything or maybe they've said what have what have we done wrong see being childless in uh, today is very bad but and the culture we're talking about this ultra conservative culture uh, in the first century, it was way more than that. It was economically potentially disastrous if you don't have kids because there'll be no one bringing the money in as you get older. So if you fall ill, you're going to be destitute. <clears throat> also, it had social implications. So people would be saying, what have they done wrong? God has cursed them. He's not allowed... Ooh, what's... So there would be lots of 
chatter. And clearly, it's shame. So uh, Elizabeth says, she refers to my reproach among people. I wonder if after decades of pain, these, this man has slowly come to terms with childlessness. And he's buried that pain. I wonder if that's happened. And then this angel turns up and says, hey, hey, I've got some news for you. You're going to have a son. And his name's going to be... And I think probably his response at that point is just, no, please, please, don't go there. Don't, don't, don't take the lid off this thing. I have tried believing God for years over this thing. And I have seen nothing. And now you come here, say, I can't cope with the pain of it. So the result in his life is this. Faith is pain. It's just pain. Don't ask me to have faith because it hurts too much. Very possible for us, you know, to pick up wounds along the way. Uh, to shut down to believing in God. Uh, we used to hear a, a, about this a lot, um, not so much anymore. Uh, it used to be that um, about 20 years ago, there was quite a lot of this, uh, you would hear about uh, a church that would gather to pray very long and earnestly for particularly children who are very sick, say a terminally ill child, young child. And I remember, I remember a story of a, uh, of a church that uh, said, yeah, we're going to get, every day we're going to pray and we're going to meet to seek God uh, for this child. And uh, then somebody says, uh, yeah, I think, I think they're going to be healed. So everyone says, oh, right, that's a word from God. And they will start praying only as the months go on for the child to die. And what could happen at that time is they're like, it's like a numbness comes over a church you encountered people in that and they're kind of totally confused by what has happened there i don't understand i thought god was gonna but he hasn't and the kind of protective sheen gathers over us at that point don't ask me to go there again or maybe it was revival for you something you know maybe years ago this year god's gonna break out and he's gonna no no he hasn't Oh, well, next year, God's going to come. And the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. How are you doing with faith? Are there places you now won't go? Are there? For some people, it's healing. Uh, no, I prayed for someone, uh, and they never got healed. In fact, they got worse. In fact, they died. I'm not going there again. I've known somebody who said, who said to me, yeah, I've sort of put that in a box. I believe everything else, but I don't believe this. Ha, huh, wow. <clears throat> it's very easy for that to happen, for faith to become too costly. And the danger with this protection that we put around ourselves is this. You could miss out on the real thing when it comes. You could do a Zachariah and say, I can't go there. No, God, don't ask me. To go there. And so this is the very time when God is saying, I want to break through into your life. And he's saying, look, look, it's going to bring joy and happiness to you. And Zachariah's response to that is, no, 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 no. The very thing that he wants now, because of his pain, he can't have. Or he's not going to have. How are you doing with faith? Is faith too costly for you? Okay. Quickly have a look at Mary. So Mary's response when the angel turns up is fantastic. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I've got to tell you, that is beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. It's a beautiful response. And uh, she agrees with the plan of God and she submits to it. And you could say, and I have heard, I've seen this written down, well, she was just young and naive. She didn't really understand what being pregnant out of wedlock meant in that culture. I, I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe that for a minute. This is a really bright, able woman. You see, uh, she ponders things in her heart. She, she questions the angel when there's a greeting. She wonders what's going on. Her brain is, is working. 
This, this is an intelligent person. I don't believe she's naive at all. And actually, think of the, the time of life she's in. Young woman. And she's just got engaged. So if you're in that age group and you're in that time of life, you, your head will be full of your future life with your husband, what that's going to be like, where are you going to live, oh, and we've got a wedding day coming up. That's what's going to be going around her head, all of that stuff. And she would have understood immediately when the angel said, I want you to be pregnant with God's son, and it won't be Joseph, it's the father, she would have understood, I'm putting everything on the line for God. I will do it because you want me to, because I love you. So she is potentially sacrificing all of her future happiness. All of her security. Her family could easily have said, get out. She is on the street and penniless. She has risked everything for God. Absolutely everything. It's why it's just so beautiful. You just think, this is a courageous person who loves God and has stepped forward to say, I'm yours. Kind of takes your breath away a bit when you think. <gasps> and of course, the contrast we have here is we have an older guy who said, I can't face the pain and the risk. And we have a younger girl who said, I will face the pain yeah. and I will face the risk. There are honest human responses that come in, aren't there, to these big, grand purposes of God. Isn't it great? Yes. Actually, there's a human re reality to that as well. Okay, we need to end. I'm just going to ask a few questions. Um, some of I've, I've asked already, but I just thought these might help you with your thinking. So, um, when did you last hear God's voice? How do you respond to the prophetic when it comes? Uh, I, when I get a prophetic word, I always write it down. I put it in my journal. Can I recommend, if you don't have a journal, can you, can you write it down? Let me, let me ask you this one. Are you a Mary or, or a Zachariah? Which side of the scale do you go? Is faith too expensive for you? And are you in danger of missing out on what God wants to do with you in this generation? You could ask as well, I guess, from that, is God disciplining you? Because sometimes he uses tough circumstances actually as a form of discipline. That's what the Bible tells us. We're going to end there. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your amazing word. I thank you for the way you love to speak to us. Father, I thank you for uh, these characters. I thank you for the way in which you break into human history. I love to read about your big plan and what you're going to do. But Lord, I ask you, please now, will you help us in our humanity to respond well to what you're saying to us? Father, would you help us to be Mary's? Lord, would you help us to be people who respond and say, yes, Lord, may your will be done. Father, would you help us to be people that are prepared to pay the price, take the risk of faith. And Lord, I pray for those who have been hurt and damaged uh, in the past. I want to ask you to undo all the damage. I want to ask you that, uh, Father, you would give them courage. I pray that healing would come, restoration would come. And Father, I ask you to get them fully in the place that you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.